Okay, thank you. Yeah, so thank you to the organizers for inviting me here. It's good to finally escape from uh, kind of uh, East Germany slash Australia. Um, <laughs> that for uh, you know, a couple of years, it was actually illegal to leave Australia. Um, and then at the beginning of the year, they opened up the borders, but the university was not allowing official travel. So I was thinking for a while that I would actually have to take leave to actually um, come here, but in the end, uh, they relaxed some of those restrictions, so. Sure, yes, yes, yes. Um, which will be a good thing to do. I'll be happy to come here for vacation. Yeah, so today I'm going to talk about some, some work in progress uh, where we've been using some MPS techniques uh, to, to study this notion of dynamical quantum phase transitions. And the way we've been doing that is using higher moments of the Loeschmidt echo, which I'll describe uh, how, how this works as we go through. So I guess the motivation, this is kind of a confused slide, but um, as to why we want to study this, uh, there are lots of, lots of experimental platforms and, and theoretical platforms uh, these days where you can really do interesting non-equilibrium phenomena. Uh, I'm specifically thinking about uh, the lattice cases um, as well as that we've got uh, continuous cases as well, but for the lattice cases that I'm primarily interested in about, I've got optical lattices, trapped ions, and in these experimental platforms, we've got all sorts of phenomena that are not accessible in typical condensed matter systems and are hard to describe using conventional thermodynamics. Um, so in particular, typically we don't have a position function or a free energy or something like that. Uh, so there's a question that when we evolve something in time, are there aspects of universality that we can find for dynamical systems burrowing from universality of equilibrium systems where we know a lot about um, like CFT and, 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 and so on. Um, so are, are there aspects of universality that we can find? Um, and a notion of this really in, in, in classical phase transitions and equilibrium phase transitions in general is this notion of a position function. So we define our position function as a, a trace of my exponential of the, um, of, of the Hamiltonian uh, as a sum of Boltzmann weights over, over all possible microstates S, from which I can define uh, a, a free energy essentially as the, as the negative log of my, of my position function. Um, so then the, the, the sort of classical definition of a phase transition is some point where my position function becomes non-analytic in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, in the thermo, well, you can, I guess you can scale it to be finite, right? Um, I mean, you can, yeah, yeah, you can scale it to be finite in the thermodynamic limit, for sure. Uh, because so this, this free energy, yeah, it's extensive, but free energy density, and then it, and then it becomes finite. Yeah, you're being very precise here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, 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 I, I, I agree, I agree, I agree, yeah, 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 we, we need to be precise, I should have put a, I should have put like a, over, over N here, yeah, 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 you, you'll see that coming up, yeah, I, I do put in the, the one over N, yeah. So we can also define a similar quantity for, for pure quantum states, uh, so we can think about now doing time evolution, so we have a quantum state and then we evolve it in time, and then we can close this off um, with, with another state. It could be the same state or it could be a different state. Um, and mathematically, this is a very similar kind of operation. Uh, so this is known as a boundary partition function. So the idea here or the general theme uh, that I'm getting at is that we can actually borrow a lot of um, physics of, of classical systems where these partition functions are, are quite well studied and we can apply these to, to DQPT, dynamical uh, quantum phase transitions as well, where this is now a quantum system. So this is known as a boundary partition function. So this then gives a correspondence to uh, classical thermodynamics. So now the setting that we have is we consider a closed quantum many body system. So we're going to ignore the environment. We'll assume that we, we don't have one. That simplifies things a lot. Uh, we'll assume it can be neglected. And we've got purely unitary dynamics and we follow a quantum quench protocol. That is, we prepare 
our Hamiltonian, if we prepare our state under some Hamiltonian, and then we suddenly quench it globally to uh, some other some other state. Uh, so we prepare we, we prepare our system in in some ground state, or it doesn't even need to be a it doesn't even need to be a ground state, but typically typically it will be. Um, and then we suddenly switch it, and we look at the time evolution of, of this state. So my psi at t is my time evolution operator with respect to my quenched value of, of, of lambda applied to my initial state. And I'm going to assume that this is a global quench. So my, my Hamiltonian is extensively different to, to H. So for example, I've changed some, some coupling constant or I've turned on a field or turned off a field or something like that. That's the, the, the typical scenario. Uh, so we can define then um, how close are we to, to our initial state by what's known as the Loschmidt echo, which is uh, essentially the overlap of my time evolved state to my initial state. So this, this overlap is telling me after I've evolved my state in time t, how close am I back to my, back to my initial state? Um, and you want to be again detailed, we can, we can actually define this Loschmidt echo parameter as, as the, the squared modulus of, of this g function. Um, you could also call that return rate or the return fidelity. Um, and this amplitude is extensive in the number of degrees of freedom, which as is, the, of course, the classical position function, which is the, the one over n that, that Frank mentioned before. Um, so my g function is generically going to be some exponential of minus n of, of my extensive system size coming in here. Okay, so uh, this r here, which is like the negative log of g divided by n, um, is, is what I call the rate function here, and we're going to realize that using matrix product states. So we'll assume 1D, and I have a matrix product state description of my initial state and my time evolved state. So then if I want to construct this Loschmidt, uh, uh, this Loschmidt amplitude, I can do that from transfer matrix techniques, that I take my infinite MPS, Assume it's translational invariant, possibly under some unit cell, but that's that's no no real complication. Uh, and I can calculate the spectrum of that, and so that means then that I can expand my I can expand my overlap as um, in 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 terms of the in terms of the eigenvalue spectrum of my transfer matrix. So then my overlap in the thermodynamic limit is going to be. Uh, my transfer matrix to the, power n, to the power n in that limit as n goes to infinity. So this will clearly be, then be dominated by the leading eigenvalue of this transfer matrix, which I refer to as, as lambda naught. Um, so for the, for the students in the audience, this is the same. If you, if you use the same MPS in, on here, then the fact that our MPS is, is normalized properly, that would mean that lam, lambda naught will be one would be the, the normalization constraint on my MPS. But here, they're two different MPS. Uh, so always this lambda naught, or the, the uh, modulus of it, is going to be strictly less than one, and unless it exactly happens to coincide with my, with my initial state again. OK, so then I can calculate my return rate, uh, which will be the, the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n of, of log of g, uh, which is exactly the negative log of lambda naught of, of my um, transfer matrix eigenvalue. So this is well defined in a thermodynamic limit, taking into account all of the all of the uh, all of the prefactors and the scaling. Okay, so now then we can define, at least for the purposes of of, of what I'll talk about today, I'll define a DQPT, a dynamical quantum. Uh, phase transition as some non-analytical behavior of this Loschmidt amplitude as a function of time. Uh, so to see an example of how this works, um, so this is following, there's some really nice review papers from Marcus Hale and, and other people. Uh, so I think Marcus actually was the first person to do this analytically for, this, for, the, for the Ising model. Uh, so what we're going to do, we'll just take the, the standard Ising model in a, in a transverse field, and we're going to start from the h to infinity limit, so start in an eigenstate of, of sigma x, and then we'll quench it to some finite value of h. And there's actually some 
uh, there's actually like some 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 analytics you can do. Uh, so certainly in the case of H equals zero, you can do some interesting analytics here. Uh, but if you actually do this, uh, so what you get, so this is lambda, so this is the uh, this is like the real part of this return rate function, which which just corresponds to taking the log of the the, the modulus of, of my of my g function. Um, so what we see here is, uh, so then this is a function of time as I'm evolving my state, uh, and what we see now is these cusps, very characteristic cusps, which indicate that there's a non-analytic point in in my return rate function. Okay, so the derivative is changing discontinuously at each of these cusps here. And we see that this behavior is, is kind of fairly generic at h equals zero, so that's where you can do some uh, like fairly easily analytics, uh, but also if we, if we do this quench to some finite value of the, 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 field, uh, the field as well. If we take it too big, then other things happen, but if our field is fairly small, this is fairly generic behavior. Right, exactly, yep, 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 yep. We'll, we'll get to that uh, um, in a second. Yep, so each, each DQPT is then associated with a kink in this rate function, and um, so our dyna dynamical quantum phase transitions then is actually a sequence, so there's a whole sequence of these phase transitions that occur in, in time, so there's a whole sequence of critical times, uh, and in simple cases, these are actually at regular intervals. Um, they appear exactly at some some fixed uh, time step between them. I think in, in more complicated cases it, it, it's not, but they do it at least appear in in some sort of approximately regular uh, regular pattern in 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 most cases. Um, so actually, I meant to update this because you can actually see some more interesting things even in one D systems as well, which is which is uh, described a bit later. So the question is, what is, this what is the origin of this non-analytic non behavior? Um, as the question pointed out, yes, this is associated with a level crossing of my transfer matrix between two different eigenvalues. Yeah, Frank? Uh, so please have symmetry, no? So what is the symmetry? Um, doesn't a level crossing mean that I don't have a symmetry. If I had a sim if I had a symmetry, that would not. If you don't have symmetry, then they repel each other. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's true. That's true. Um, in in that sense, yeah, yeah, yeah. If we had a yeah, yeah, yeah. What's what's um? Yeah, yeah that's actually a good question. We did the transverse field Ising model, right? Yeah. I mean, it's kind of an exactly solvable model. Is that anything to do possibly also could be integrable? Uh, no. This is all very generic. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, have question. Shouldn't it be the symmetry related to the multiplicity of all the spectrum, not just to memory? Oh. Um, oh, can you see this? Right, so this, this is the actual spectrum for one of these cases, right? So this is a h equals 0 0.2. But what I've plotted here, well, on log scale as well, which is why it looks a bit different, but what I've plotted here is the higher eigenvalues of my transfer matrix. So, you get the, yeah, so you get the crossovers here. It, it's true, that's an interesting question, it's actually why do you see that? Is there some symmetry principle associated with it? I've never actually thought of that before, yeah. Wait, wait, um, the lambdas are complex numbers, right? Right, so this is the, this is the real part of, of right. that. So do they actually cross each other as in the, the actual numbers are the same, or is it just the amplitudes, the modulus cross each other? Um, so what happens is that all of these, um, all of these eigenvalues have a different phase. So then what happens as they cross each other, if you just follow, say, the bottom one, you get this cusp, and the phase changes discontinuously. At, at, at okay, point. okay, so that means it's not like a, uh, because you're dealing with complex numbers, it's not a true level. Oh, okay, okay, so that explains yeah, it. Right, 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 it's not a symmetry. Right, right, okay, right. That, that explains Except it. in some cases, we'll look at some cases later where, the, where it is, where it does become an exact degeneracy. Um, if you were to break the Z2 symmetry, let's say that you add a longitudinal field, does it still... Yeah. Show these sharp cusps. Uh, yes, it does, and we'll actually see an example of that. We'll see an example of that a bit later on. Yeah. Uh, maybe a more trivial question about this concept of dynamical phase transition. I think that well, in, in a conventional concept, you have like two phases ac across the transition. Right. What are the two phases? Um. Can you can you think about some kind of order parameter, or they're just diagnosing 
Uh, I don't think so, because I mean, in, in a sense, we've got an infinite number of phases. If you think of whenever we pass a, a critical point, so it's not we're in another phase, we've actually got like an infinite sequence of these as we go on, as we go on in time. But maybe then, could you say what distinguish one phase from another, one phase from another? So are they are there really phases uh, at each side of the cusp, or it's just uh... are they different phases on each side of the cusp? Ah, uh, look, that's a philosophical question to him. So, so, no. I'd, say, I'd, say I'd say probably not, but they are distinguishable in the sense that there's a non-analytic point of, of my function. Uh, I've got a function here which is discontinuous at, at, at this point, and I look on one side and I look on the other. Um, yeah, so there's, there's certainly some, something happening here. But then the, the name, where the, does the name comes from? This Dynamical phase. So I understand the dynamical right. yeah. Yeah. phase. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'd say phase transition as, as defined by analogy to um, classical partition functions uh, that then actually tell me you know, the, the equilibrium phases. Uh, so I can comment that there have been discussions about the aptitude of this name in the past. I think this is not Ian's uh, issue. Uh, right. yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm not inventing terminology here at all. Yeah. But you could say it's the phase of the of the of the eigenvalue. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, this effect also exists even if you do single spins, right? You don't need a spin change to see these crossings, correct? Or do you really need like a one-dimensional physical system? Um, like with a single spin. We do because. Uh, for, for this for this notion, yes, because this actually depends on having these non-analyticities in the position function depends on having the thermodynamic limit. So this was a big kind of like mystery, I think, decades ago in in the general theory of phase transitions that if I write down a position function, so we'll, we'll talk about this a bit later. If I write down a position function on a finite size system, it's an analytic function. It's it's infinitely differentiable everywhere. Um, so how do I get an actual phase transition? emerging. And the answer is actually there's a bit of complex analysis on the slide coming up shortly, and the answer is that you need to take the thermodynamic limit to get those non-analytic points to actually to actually emerge. Um, but yeah, we can we'll, we'll cover we'll cover that we'll cover that shortly. Um, yeah, so there's a question which we've of, of how universal is is this um, is there a notion of a dynamical quantum phase? Well, we've touched on that a bit. What I think what I mean by phase to me actually means what is the nature of these this sequence of, of crossings? Like can can we say something? Can we say something about them? Um, can we get something other than just a, a simple crossing? Can can we get other types of behaviour? Um, so there's also this notion of non-analyticities in an order parameter or, or correlation functions as well. Um, and this is actually a different, a distinct way of, 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 of a distinct notion of, of DQPT that in principle has no immediate connection to what we're talking about now of the Lorschmidt echo. Um, but in some cases, so down here, in some cases, in some models we've looked at, we do get cusps which are associated with um, some behavior of the order parameter. In other cases, we, we don't. So we get what, what, what Jan Hallamay calls these anomalous cusps that just appear unrelated to that. Um, so Matson's group actually only, only discovered this paper on the weekend, uh, but there's also a, a classification into two distinct types of, of um, DQPT. Sorry, that should be, that should be a T. Um, that dif differ in their entanglement properties, properties of this processional DQBT and an entanglement DQBT. It's exactly what happens to uh, exactly what is the mechanism that I get this that I get this crossover. So this this one's associated with a with an avoided level crossing of the entanglement spectra, uh, whereas this one's not. They're, they're, they're very widely separated. Um, so yeah, there's there's all sorts of there's all sorts of notions at the moment, but there's nothing. I don't think there's anything that's really fixed and, and settled on on these questions. Uh, so there's a question, of course, of how do, how do these notions relate to any of the other notions on, on this, which I think is completely up in the air at the moment. Um, so okay, so um, what I'm going to talk about today is how we actually calculate these and some techniques that we can use to actually probe these in more detail. 
Uh, so the, the main thing, uh, the, the good takeaway message is that actually, well, if we've got a complex function, uh, we shouldn't just define it along our like imaginary axis of like real time. Uh, we should define it everywhere in the complex plane. If, if we're going to talk about discontinuities and non-analytic points of my complex function, I should think about this in the complex plane, not just along my my my, my time evolution line. Uh, so if we think about um, our, our G function, our, our um, Loschmidt echo, uh, we can expand this out in, in the cumulants. Uh, so my rate function, in fact, this is, this is actually like um, just essentially the generating function of the cumulants. Uh, so I can write my cumulants um, in terms of like the negative one over n of my log of, of this function, and I can get a polynomial expansion in that, if I can calculate these, these cumulants here. Um, so, yeah, coming back to what is a phase transition, for a finite system, then my G function here is just a sum of exponentials. It's some finite sum of exp exponentials. It might be very big, but it's still a finite sum of exponentials, which means that it's an entire function, um, uh, which means that we can, we can characterize it by the location of its zeros. Okay, so this, this h of z here, we can ignore it's a smooth part. So we can characterize the function entirely by the location of the zeros in the complex plane. And, yeah. Was oh, this related to this uh, Yang Li zeros? Uh, very closely related. Yang Li zeros are where you make the magnetic field complex. Um, so, and because of that, there are some theorems about Yang Li zeros that don't apply to Fisher zeros and, and, and vice versa. But yeah, it's a, it's a really, very, very related. Is that Fisher zeros? These are Fisher zeros. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think some, some DQB people don't call these Fisher, but I, I think they are, because that, that's exactly what Fisher did. Uh, just generalize the temperature to the, to the complex plane. Okay, right. So then I can define my rate function, again, for a finite system. Uh, I just take the log of, I just take the log of this, uh, I can ignore this part uh, that, that, that is smooth, and I can characterize it as this log. Now, we, if we take the thermodynamic, right, so these, these, these zeros here are known as Fisher zeros. So for a finite system, what you do is you explore the complex plane, and you just physically find where are all of these zeros here. And then what you do is, is you do this for a whole bunch of system sizes, and then what you do is you accumulate these zeros somewhere on the complex plane, and if you say, ah, yes, they're about to hit the real axis, then I've got the phase transition at that inverse temperature. Uh, so that's, that, that's the, the kind of classical approach to, to these to these Fisher zeros. Um, so now, what we, what we have, we have an infinite MPS, of course, so we're already in the thermodynamic limit. So what we can do here is replace this summation here by an integral. So kind of essentially what we have here is this rho of z, which we can sort of think of as the, the density the density of zero is in, in the thermodynamic limit. Um, now, a couple of notes to, to point out here, because which really confused me when I started looking at this, because thinking, well, I'm taking an overlap of two MPS. It's like an eigenvalue problem of this transfer matrix. That's basically never going to be zero. Um, but yeah, that's true, actually. In the thermodynamic limit, there actually aren't any zeros of this G of Z function. Normally, there are some special cases. I'll talk about it. But instead, we just simply associated this with a discontinuity in, in my rate function, or in, in, uh, in, in G itself. Um, right. So uh, I should make a note as well that this rate function is equivalent to the complex representation of 2D electrostatics, which is like really nice. If you want to do electrostatics in 2D, you just write everything using complex numbers and it, it, it works brilliantly. So we can think of this R of Z as my rate function of the complex potential. Um, so the real part of that is my what you'd normally think of as, as the, the potential function in electrostatics. Uh, the contours of the imaginary part, then if I plot the, the, the contours of the imaginary part, it gives me kind of like the, the analogy of the lines of force of, of this. And we can calculate kind of this charge density uh, from the from the Laplacian of, of the potential as usual. Uh, we've also got the analogy of the electric field 
as the gradient of, of my potential, which I can just write down from the real and imaginary parts of, of, the, of the derivatives here. And the, so the nice thing, that the, the reason why you do this in complex numbers, then is that Stokes' theorem and Gauss's theorem just follow from the cauchy riemann uh, equations on your, uh, on, on, on your complex function. Um, so the component of, yeah, so yeah, that, that gives you all of these um, sort of nice theorems. Um, so now then the component of my electric field, which is tangent to a discontinuity of, of the charge, is continuous, which is the real part of my, my rate function, what, what people normally think of when they talk about the, the logic of the echo. Um, and then the imaginary part of that is discontinuous, which we saw kind of before from this crossing of, of eigenvalues, the phases of those eigenvalues are just going to be different as, as, they, as they cross each other. Um, okay, so then, as I said before, I think it really makes sense then to extend this notion of DQPTs to consider my rate function R of Z in the entire complex plane. Uh, so for infinite systems, we can calculate these, uh, this R of Z function pretty easily. Uh, we just use TEBD or TDBP or your, your favorite time evolution algorithm. And then we just look at uh, the overlap, which then just gives me from, um, as, as we talked about before, the eigenvalue of my mixed transfer matrix. Uh, so something that's really nice is that you can actually do this if you want to get the entire complex plane. You do one simulation in real time, it gives you psi of t. You do another simulation in imaginary time, it gives you psi beta, and then the overlap between those, like, um, you've got n steps of time evolution, n steps of real time evolution, then you just, the overlaps of them just give you like n squared data points uh, everywhere in the complex plane, essentially, which is, which is kind of nice. Uh, and if you wanted to extend to double the time, you could just take the complex conjugate. Of that one. But, you know, is this the optimal way? Would you it doesn't matter which, just, could just take two arbitrary kind of, of lines, no? So why don't you do it? Yeah, yeah, you could. You, you don't have to go along real time and, and imaginary time. You could go at 45 degrees yes. if you wanted to. Is that better? Um, it could. The time you expect, you expect a volume, are you... Yeah, yeah, I mean, it could be, because you, if you're evolving in, in imaginary time, you expect that you can evolve towards some ground state of either plus h or minus h. Um, that, that may or may not be good. To, to do, I don't know. Well, that's my question. Then. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the examples I've looked at, they're all pretty simple ones. So the bond dimensions are really small anyway. Um, so it hasn't come up that I've wanted to, to make this more efficient. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, not, not something I thought about, but yeah, it, it could it could be a good idea to do that. Yeah. Okay. So what we want to do then is I actually want to calculate, which before we can we have a, a complex function, we want to do some kind of polynomial expansion at, at some point. So I don't want not only this return rate, I want the derivatives of that as well. Uh, so the idea then, um, well, if we want to calculate uh, these derivatives, these are related to, I think this slide is actually slightly out of order. Um, yeah, I probably wanted to do this one first. Um, so what we want is actually derivatives of my return rate. So uh, these logarithmic derivatives are pretty well known, but if you haven't seen it before, if I just take the, the just take the first derivative, say, of my g of t function, that, so that was like minus one over n times the log of my overlap. What I get is it just pulls down a factor h here, and I normalize it by this overlap here at the bottom. Um, so I can write it, then I can write it in this form. So my derivative of the rate function is my expectation value of h, uh, and then normalized, and then divide by n, divide by my system size. Um, which we think, if we think about this, yeah, this is actually well defined, that my Hamiltonian is extensive, but I div divide by my system size n, so this is essentially kind of the energy per site. But it's a mixed expectation value between, between these two different states. So this is going to be some complex number um, in general. Uh, now, algorithmically, uh, we've actually known how to calculate these kind of operators for quite a long time in, in MBS. 
Okay, clearly it's something simple like the Hamiltonian, we know what the energy is, we can calculate it. If we've got a more complicated case, say we've got exponentially decaying long range interactions, or if you wanted to calculate h squared or h cubed, and so on, it's, it's more complicated, but there are algorithms for doing that. Uh, so there's a, a paper back from, um, back from 2010 where we presented like a full algorithm of how to do this in, in general for one of these, one of these extensive um, MPOs. So what that tells me is I, if I want to calculate my Hamiltonian to the power n, I can expand this, sorry, this should be a, um, yeah, yeah, this, this is my system size L. What I get is a polynomial function of my system size, um, sort of in an asymptotic large L limit. So if I just do this for the Hamiltonian, uh, I would just get n equal to 1 here, so it would just be a linear function. If I did it for h squared, it will be a quadratic function, so I'll have a, a part that, that um, increases at L squared, which would actually just be the energy squared, and a part that's linearly extensive, which for the Hamiltonian, it would be the variance, the energy variance. Uh, so this recursive algorithm in, in this paper just determines all of these coefficients, and once you've got those coefficients, you can write them as the cumulants, which is the, the easier way to expand uh, these, these derivatives. Um, and actually the same, the same procedure applies for the high derivatives as well. So basically whenever we take another derivative, it pulls out another factor of h into, into the numerator here as well. So what we need to do then is, is calculate these moments here, the, the moments of h with respect to my two different MPS. Uh, and once I've done that, once I've calculated my cumulants, then I have a polynomial uh, series expansion for my rate function, which if you remember was the logarithm of this. So the rate function is just a bit in, in the brackets here. Uh, okay, so uh, an actual calculation. So uh, now this is actually, well, the, an example we had before, my quenching the Ising model from h to infinity down to h equals, h equals 0 0.4. Now, um, with respect to imaginary time evolution beta and real time evolution in, in the, the top direction. So the plot we showed before actually was just going along this line here at, at beta equals 0. So all of these, uh, all of these lines here correspond to the discontinuities in my rate function uh, that, that I plotted before. Um, okay, but what we can see here, well, we, we plot the phase as well, um, the phase of the, the eigenvalues, so, uh, which is, sorry, which is the discontinuity in phase of my rate function as I cross, as I cross these points here. Yeah, well, I don't understand this picture, so can you repeat what it is? Right, so what we're plotting here is the discontinuities in my rate function in the complex plane. Okay, so, um, so the plot I had before uh, showed, so if we, if we go like way, way back here, um, this one, h equals 0 0.4, but we can see I've got a cusp here, 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 but the location of those cusps, if I go at b3 equals 0, I evolve it in time, that's the same locations as I've got, as I've got here. So the color coding is the discontinuity in phase between the two eigenvalues as I, as I go along. So we can think of these, we can think of all of the gaps in between here where there's, where there's nothing as, as locations where my rate function is analytic in, in that region. And I've got these lines of discontinuity between different regions. What is the lines of zero or Fisher zero? Uh, these lines here are what you will call Fisher zeros, yes. If you did this for a finite system, what you'd see is like just a whole bunch of zero, of actual zeros of your rate function, but sort of spaced, spaced along all of these lines here. Okay. And as you increase your system size, the, the density of those zeros would get bigger and bigger. Right. This phase, what is the meaning of this phase? Because isn't that arbitrary? Because it's like you take a different gauge for your MPS and you will get a different phase. Um, the phase differences are not. The phase differences are well defined. In fact, they actually kind of go to zero at, 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 both, ends of the, at both ends of the spectrum. Uh, like for, for, for very for infinite leader and in, in, on, on both sides. So my, sorry, uh, yes, if these lines go, if this difference goes to zero, it means that there is no line of Fisher zero or there is still a line? 
Um, if it goes, if it actually goes, so it's a phase difference. It actually goes to zero. We'll see an example there that is, this corresponds to a terminating visual light. So there is no phase actually because you can go around, right? It's a single phase. Yes, 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 yes. You all, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone is, uh, it's really nice actually, everyone was sort of guessing. <laughs> so, so I, but I don't understand this point. So, so the local tensors are, you can multiply a local tensor with an arbitrary phase and it's still well, the same NPS, no? Um, right, but there's a, div there's a division here. Right, so if I multiply phi by some phase or one of the A, the a matrix by some phase or something like that, I'm dividing it again down yeah, here. Okay. So, so in, in the end, it's all gate invariant. And you can kind of see that as well from the fact that it's a complex function. So we've got the Cauchy Schwartz, sorry, we've got the, the Cauchy Riemann equations to relate the real and the, the, the imaginary components of, of my rate function. So uh, I'm not free just to choose the imaginary part differently. It's all it's all they're all um, they're all they're all connected because this is a in, in between in between the discontinuities it's an analytic function. Okay, so and this formula and the previous Slide, you basically have to divide by the norm. Is that correct? Right, yeah. The lowest, no, wait. The... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this is absolutely essential. This is why I, I used to think that these, these expectation values here, the numerator, would be not very well defined because it's extensive, but it gets multiplied by an exponential. Uh, but the, the trick is here, uh, you, divide by the, you divide by this, which, which, makes it, which makes it well defined. But then the lowest equation, yeah, but um, don't do it, no? Uh, yeah, this one's... Yeah, there should be a 1 over n in here somewhere. Um, Frank is asking why is there not a 1 over psi beta psi t normalization factor there? Yeah, something like phi. Uh, so this is psi of t here, so this is this, is this one. Um, I mean, this is literally what you get if you just take if you just take the, the g of t function minus minus one over n times log of of of, of psi naught with psi t. Just take the derivative with respect to z, and you get exactly this. That's no, okay. I won't. I won't confuse. Yeah. Okay. But okay. So this is what we get then for, for our simple Ising model um, example. Uh, so yeah. So. Um, the, the sort of classical DQPT is when a line um, crosses the real part of Z equals zero, and then it's it's along somewhere along along this line here. But we've generalized it now to the entire complex plane. So yeah, is there a reason why there's no crossings between these lines? Sorry, there's no. Oh, you mean that they don't intersect? Yes. In this example, they don't. But I'll see. We'll see an example soon oh. where they do. Yeah. 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 Sorry again. So in the case for, for bend infinity, so all the lines will just bend out upwards, I guess, right? Because you're just calculating the overlap between the ground state of the Hamiltonian and some initial state. Um, uh, if, you, if, you, if you will be able to calculate this with bend infinity, then you just... Um, for every time, time step in the real state. Yeah, I mean, it becomes numerically very, yeah, yeah, but very, I mean, very hard, hard right, for, 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 for that becomes but crazy. But, like, yeah. but um, I mean, you can do this analytically. Certainly, if you've got like h equals zero, you can do this analytically, and they do they do continue to, to um, so they disappear kind of in the limit. But you you have to take that limit before they before they disappear. Are limits are still okay. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm only about halfway through, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so if we know if we know these moments of my rate function, it actually tells me a lot of information. Um, so uh, we can identify these discontinuities like uh, very easily from looking at these. So, for example, uh, at these cusps, the the slope is discontinuous. So we can just look at the first cumulant and see that. Yeah. The moments at any particular point. Do they tell you? Sorry, please. If you look at the moments at one particular point in that like beta yeah. time phase diagram, yeah. do they tell you uh, where the phase transition happens, or is it one of those things where you, you can't tell by just looking at a point? Um, right. Yeah. So we're looking at where the. In most cases, you can't tell. You need to look on both sides of the. 
you need to look on both sides of the discontinuity. The lines. Right. Yeah, yeah, because it's, a, it's in, in most cases, in ordinary discontinuity, you need to look at both and, and, see, and, and see where they cross. There, are, there is an exception to that, which I probably won't have time to talk about, but it's really interesting. So I, I'll try and speed up and get to it. Okay, so, um, yeah, so then if we know the higher moments, we can kind of imagine we can actually calculate like, the, the tangent curve um, at the visual line at, at some point. Uh, if we know the second cumulant, then we can calculate the curvature of that line and so on. In fact, you could even write down the entire equation. The equation of the visual line, if you've got um, two points F1 and F2 as your polynomial expansion on, on two sides of the dis discontinuity, then you can just write down, well, the real part of F1 is equal to the real part of F2, and then you get an equation for the official line between them. So at least in principle, if you, if you um, had enough uh, if you had enough cumulants, you could just say, like, look at one point here and one point here, and then calculate like this line for quite a long, a long period. Okay. Um, so yeah, just some related work. I kind of skipped this. So people have done this for finite systems. There's some really nice work. I've been, I've been sort of in communication with these guys. Uh, it's really nice, but as you can imagine, it's kind of tedious that we have to do <coughs> finite size and then guess from the location of all of these zeros where the lines will become like solid lines in, in the thermodynamic limit. Um, this has also been done, so there's a really nice paper from, from, from Valentin uh, when, when he was here, uh, and they, they looked at this, so this is a long range rising model. Uh, this is really nice as well, just, just, looking at the, just looking at the rate function without looking at the cumulants. So this is really, we can kind of view this as a follow up to this kind of work that now, if we calculate the moments of the, the rate function, we can actually do a lot better. Uh, and in particular, calculating these Fisher lines is, is really automatic. We just feed it into a program and it spits out the, spits out the equations of the Fisher lines, which is, which is really nice. That would have been, I think, a, a fair bit of manual work to actually calculate this, this plot, for example. Um, so there's a, another example is the quantum three-state plots model. Uh, so I'll try and do this, this, this pretty quickly. Um, so I guess going beyond the Ising model, this is really about the first, the first target you could look at. Uh, something that they noticed from their calculation was that in some cases they get some very smooth, like no cusps um, at all, and in some other cases they actually get, uh, they actually saw some cusps that have some interesting behaviour uh, in in particular, this one here, where it looks like maybe it's developing if you tune uh, if you tune the Hamiltonian properly, like maybe it's developing into something which is more than just a linear cusp, uh, as, as they intersect. Um, so this was actually clarified by by Yan Tao Wu, which is a really nice paper, uh, using infinite TVD that if you tune JC exactly right uh, and you tune T exactly right, you actually get a square root divergence. Um, of, of the rate function at, uh, at, 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 that, at that critical point, um, and it disappears completely. There's no cusp at all, it's very smooth. If you take J smaller than that, if you take J bigger than that, then it just turns into a conventional linear, linear cusp. Can you also do the nine state box model? Sorry? Can you also do the nine state box model? Nine state box model. So, yeah, that's, that's equivalent to the bilinear bi-quadratic model F3. Okay. 0.25. So it's, it's interesting to see that. Uh, anyway, it, it's yeah, a, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I was yeah, just wondering I'll, I'll that. Start the calculations tonight. I'll give yeah. it, no, no. <laughs> okay, so it's, it's doable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in, in principle, I mean, you know, I, 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 if the entanglement is massively big and it's too hard to do, that, that could be the case. But, yeah, in, in principle, sure. Okay. So actually, if we if we look at the Fisher lines here. Uh, ignore these parts, there's some, some data missing here, but ignore these, ignore these gaps here. But what we actually see in the Fisher line analysis is the point that, that Yang Tao Wu identified um, exactly corresponds to this point here. Right, sorry, the, the, these, these are probably maybe too small to super read, sorry I didn't have time to fix it up. But this is beta here, this is like the imaginary time, this is real time evolution here. Uh, so the point that Yang Tao Wu was looking at is exactly here, where our official line actually ends. Um, so that's actually really interesting. We can also see as well that actually the phase difference goes to zero at that point as well. So it corresponds then to a genuine degeneracy 
in, in my transfer matrix at that, at that point. Uh, so if we look at it in more detail, uh, this, is, this is a slice just going up this way. Um, so that's time going in that direction and my rate function here, we can see, uh, well in principle it would go up to infinity if I had infinite, infinitely small time slices. But, um, and the color here is the phase, so you can actually see that the phase, the discontinuity in the phase goes to zero as well. As we go up higher, then we just have ordinary cusps here, and we have a discontinuity, like an ordinary level crossing, uh, and we have a discontinuity in the phase. And you can see that if we actually plot the phase, this is actually a different point, but it's the same idea, that what happens is as we approach, um, as we approach the end point of the Fisher line, the, the discontinuity in the phase goes to zero. Uh, and looking, if we look at the higher cumulants, uh, this is actually C, the, um, uh, actually C1, C2, and C3, but actually see that they're strongly diverging. So this is going up to like 10 to the power 6 numerically for the, for the third cumulant example. So you can see very clearly that there's divergence. Um, so I'm basically out of time, I guess, which is why I'm a little bit standing up. Um, but actually, there's, yeah, so someone was asking, do you see intersections of these lines? Yes, we have seen intersections of these lines too. Um, now, this one was actually just like a really happy accident because the first time I tried to reproduce Yangtao Wu's result, I had the sign of the Hamiltonian flipped in my simulation, and it took me ages to work out why is this not working. Um, but so, this is actually the anti ferromagnetic flux model, which is kind of a weird model, but that's okay. I mean, we, we want to find different behaviors that we can see. So, and we actually see it here, that now we've got this phenomenon where we've got these intersections where we've got three of these lines um, coming together. And I'm basically out of time, but we'll say, yeah, at, 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 this, at these points, again, the cumulants diverge. Um, I haven't actually calculated what that exponent is yet, but I think, I think it's, um, I think it's minus a half, uh, but I'll make a point now that since we're looking at um, these, these functions in a complex plane, all of the mathematics that people have done in the past on Fisher zeros, we can instantly apply now to DQBT. Uh, so for example, uh, people have seen uh, these um, uh, singular points that have an exponent of two thirds, which is associated with a triple degeneracy now of uh, our, our eigenvalues, uh, but this actually I think isn't it because the difference in slope here is not going to zero. So it's not actually it's not actually a, um, a triple discontinuity. It's just that the real part is happening to coincide, but the phase the phase of the other um, eigenvalues is different. So I th I'm pretty sure that this will actually turn out to be a, um, a square root singularity. But at least in, in the literature on on uh, on, on Fisher zeros, it's known that you can get uh, other other cases as well. So that will be, a, I think, a task now to, to look for one of these in, in the, the DQPT. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm way over time, so uh, I'll just leave it up there. And thanks to, uh, to the people that I've been working with, mostly Jad, so I've got a paper on this coming out now. And, and these are the guys who are doing the, the finite size uh, Fisher uh, calculations as well. Yeah, so thank you.